Last week, I took to the beginning of the Raw Review and I said my prayer to God, asking for him to save the WWE and for him to save WrestleMania 32. And while I'm not privy to the divine design, I can only hope that my eternal prayer is answered and that Triple H, God himself, comes back to save the WWE and WrestleMania 32. Ugh. But in the meantime, I'm left here as his prophet, as the Messiah of all of you. And I don't know what to do. So I've decided to take big action. Big action! I only pull this out when it is absolutely necessary. And I feel if there was ever an appropriate time, now is it! Because desperate times call for desperate measures. Dear President Obama, Hello, Barry. Remember me? I know you're kind of preoccupied right now with your lame duck year in the middle of your no-gives-a-fuck tour of your presidency, just waiting for the next unfortunate asshat to take this job from you so you could go vacation in Hawaii for the next 30 years. But please understand that there is still important things that could be done to help further cement your legacy, your presidency. You could be a hero to millions! Millions! And all we ask of you is one simple request. We notice now that you finally decided to take action on expanding background checks and other gun control measures, meaning you are finally deciding to show some real courage and, dare I say, some leadership. Well, if you want to validate once and for all that Barry has the same type of balls as Bush did, then we have one simple request for you. That you immediately, immediately issue Executive Order 123-HHH, which indicates that the WWE must give Triple H the title at the Royal Rumble, and then he must go on to face The Rock at WrestleMania 32. I need it. The people want it. And by God, Mr. President, you know you've got to have it. Please help us. Please pass Executive Action 123-HHH. We need this. Praise God. P.S. Send Michelle my love and let her know that if anything happens between you two, that I'm here for her. Because as she probably already knows, or she is eager to find out, it is true indeed that once you go white, you know you've been licked right. Why, well, I will send this off to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and I cannot await the response of the president as he issues Executive Order 123.HHH. Amen, hallelujah, and most importantly of all, praise God. Ugh. Who's ready to talk about Raw? Now, just one little gripe complaint as a wrestling fan. You know, in today's age, especially when it comes to the wrestling business, so many things get spoiled ahead of time. It's really hard to keep that element of surprise. It frustrates me when the WWE leaks ahead of time who's going to be announced as the first inductee, the next inductee, the last inductee into their yearly Hall of Fame classes. I hate that. Because that was part of the appeal to me. Is you would sit there and watch Raw every week to find out who was going to be that individual. You might get some reports, but unconfirmed reports. So it never meant that anything was for sure. But now they're leaking it out ahead of time. And I understand the philosophy. I just, from a purely fan standpoint, I just can't stand it. And it pisses me off that it was already spoiled for me before Raw that Sting was going to be the first inductee into the 2016 WWE Hall of Fame class. However, with that said, though, I think it's appropriate when you think of guys that should be headlining Hall of Fame classes. Sting most certainly ranks atop of that list. And, you know, it, it's like one of these full circle things uh, for me as a wrestling fan to see that, you know, the last holdout, the last outlaw of the business, if you will, that never went to Vince and never needed Vince and never had to have Vince help him to become a big star finally came to the WWE and we got to see it. So it's not going to be one of those what would have happened or what ifs. We at least got to see it in some way, shape, or form. 
But when talking about Sting, and I'll probably do a separate video talking about the career and the legacy of Sting, you know, when I think back on it, I mean, this guy had a long, long run at the top, and he was a big, big star, and he influenced a lot of people that came up later on in the professional wrestling business. There is no question about it. And when I think of wrestlers that I respect the most, you know, to me, guys that I like or guys that I rooted for over the years, guys that I enjoy, guys that I was entertained by, that's one thing. But to me, there are those rare guys that have my eternal, like, undying respect. And that, to me, means more than anything else. I know Undertaker is the wrestler that I respect more than anybody in the history of the business. You know, there's, he's earned that respect from me. I respect him more than I respect Hogan. Now, I still respect Hogan a tremendous deal, my favorite wrestler of all time, for all that he did throughout his career and what he ultimately meant to the professional wrestling business. But in terms of pure respect, I might argue that Sting is at the very, very top of that list, surpassed by maybe only Taker or perhaps somebody like Eddie Guerrero and maybe Mick Foley, and has surpassed Hulk Hogan. That's how much respect I have for the man the legend, the icon, the man they call Sting. You know, it's a shame that younger generations missed out on the greatness of Sting, Surfer Sting, Crow Sting. You know, I think about it this way. People always talk about the greatness of the NWO and WCW 96 to 98, and that was a great run. It was a great time in the business. But to me, what always made that work was that whole year-long buildup from the end of 96 until Starcade 97 to get to Sting versus Hogan. That's some of the most entertaining professional wrestling, sports entertainment television that I have ever, ever seen. And it worked because it was Sting. And I can't wait to see his speech at the Hall of Fame ceremony. And I can only hope that we'll get to see him at least one more time in the ring um, as an active wrestler. I, I hope so. I'll talk more about Sting. You know, it's great to see. I just wish the WWE didn't spoil this shit for me. So I've got to confess, I did have quite a bit of fun watching this show until we got to the tail end of it. Because that opening segment just set me off. You've got all these superstars standing up on the ramp looking fucking ridiculous. With one exception, obviously. <laughs> You got Vince and Stephanie in the ring, and they're talking about the people that could come after Roman Reigns and win the belt because it's one versus all. And Vince McMahon says, Dolph Ziegler! Ah, ah. And he said it more than once, Dolph Ziegler! <laughs> He's been working for you for over 10 years, and you still don't know what the fuck his name is! <laughs> Even the boss man says, Fuck you, Dolph Ziegler! Go away and fuck off and don't come back! <laughs> but this could work out to Dolph's advantage. It could. Let's give all types of different enunciations and plug in all types of different vowels for him. He can get five entries into the 2016 Royal Rumble, five potential shots at the title. He could be Dolph Zagler. He could be Dolph Ziegler. He could be Dolph Ziggler. He could be Dolph Zagler. And he could be Dolph Zuggler. He could get five entries. That's for you, Mick Foley. <laughs> And then you got Vince and Stephanie talking about how the beauty Big E can do it and how that ain't booty. Trying to sit there and say, hey, we're not that white. All the while, just perfectly personifying just how Caucasian and redneck Vince McMahon truly fucking is. A lot of ain't booty. <laughs> I was expecting him to come out next and say, for shizzle, my nizzle. <laughs> and then you have out of the blue, here's fucking Bray Wyatt standing up on the table. The only thing I'm thinking about the whole time as he's, this fat ass is talking, I'm saying, please, God, <laughs> let that table collapse. <laughs> this is an opening segment. This just had so many elements of fucking awesome train wreck to it. And then they mentioned that it could be Brock Lesnar. But instead of choosing this moment, you know, before the national championship game, it actually kicked off where you had a chance to maybe hook in the viewers right away by just saying, fuck it, Brock Lesnar's going to be there right away. We'll incorporate him throughout the show. You decide to lazily slow play it until the fucking end and end up telegraphing what's going to go on. It was a huge missed opportunity. So that had me roll into this whole fucking opening segment. Just kicked off the night right for me. 
because this was one of these examples of train wreck bad being fucking awesome. But with all the hilarity of the opening segment, one thing still managed to grind my gears and chap my ass. That's for you, Tay Diggs. Is the fact that front and center on the ramp during the opening segment is a former multiple-time world champion, the one they call the world's strongest man, sexual chocolate himself, Mr. Mark Henry, and we don't even acknowledge him. Why can we not mention him as being a credible threat to win the Royal Rumble? He's the world's strongest man, damn it! What did he do to piss you off? Nothing! Nothing! You better like Mark Henry. You better love Mark Henry. Because if you don't... If you don't like Mark Henry, fuck you! You damn right. Now anyways, as I was referencing, there was some other fun shit on this show for me. You know, they had Seamus cover fucking Potato Dean Ambrose from behind, and he was hash rounding him, and then Dean Ambrose was fucking hash rounding him back. It was like I was saying, Potatoes are riding! Horida! Horida! And Seamus ended up having a head full of a russet red potato mess, if you will. That's for you, Gold Standard. Oh, she was awesome. You know, you got your David Bowie tribute. Here comes Stardust. <laughs> They're still going with this shit. <laughs> they just brought him back on, so that way he can job to Titus O'Neil again? Yes! <laughs> That's for all the black fans. That's all you get. That and maybe the New Day. Maybe. They had the social outcast. <laughs> they decked out in their own t-shirts. To be fair, they gave them merch right away. Hey, that's a way to establish a faction. Give them fucking shirts. Give them merch. <laughs> and they came out and challenged the Lennon family. <laughs> and the look on Bray Wyatt's face was priceless. <laughs> <laughs> It was almost like they were ripping the Wyatt family. It looked like they legitimately didn't know that this was coming. I'm sure they did, but the look said it all. It was fucking priceless. They made Slater challenge in the Wyatt family. Oh, this was fucking epic. I can't wait to see what they do with this Job Squad 2.0 and the going forward. And then the highlight reel. Chris Jericho. The New Day, the Usos, I'm all down with this shit. I don't care if they carry this crap all the way through to WrestleMania. You know, I'd be all for a Chris Jericho, uh, Xavier Woods one-on-one -on -one match. I don't know if it necessitates a WrestleMania spot, but I'm not saying it wouldn't necessi necessitate or justify a WrestleMania spot. This is just one of these things you stumble into that just reeks of entertainment value. It reeks of awesomeness. That's for you, Edge and Christian. And it just reeks of being entertaining. And that's for you, Mr. Rout. For you! But then, unfortunately, we had other stuff on the show, too, that was just kind of... <clears throat> now, before we get to some of the bad shit that happened on this show, I know a lot of you are heartbroken Daniel Bryan fans. You missed that goat-faced son of a bitch, and it burns you in your loins like you've got the clap. It just eats away at you. It gnaws away at you. You see this golden opportunity to get your golden boy back in the big spotlight and get him back into the title picture and have him back main eventing WrestleMania 32. Well, it's probably not going to happen. And you've just got to let it go. But I wonder what Daniel Bryan fans are thinking right now. And the number one Daniel Bryan fan that I can think of is Delexman. And this, my friend, is for you. I have created an ode, an anthem, that should be a rallying cry for every single professional wrestling fan in the universe. We miss Daniel Bryan. We love Daniel Bryan. We need Daniel Bryan. We have to have Daniel Bryan. And it is only right that the WWE finally medically clear him and bring him back so he can immediately take his rightful place in the main event of WrestleMania 32. Join with me as this song becomes our anthem, becomes our rallying cry. A one, a two, a one, two, three. Daniel, Daniel Bryan, there is no denying. Daniel, Daniel Bryan, my love for you is undying. Daniel, Daniel Bryan, you're so great at high flying. Daniel, Daniel Bryan, I need you back. 
have to stop by crying. Daniel, Daniel Bryan, no you means Benny, I'm not buying. Daniel, Daniel Bryan, your return on Badly Iron. Daniel, Daniel Bryan, for the world title you should be buying. Daniel, Daniel Bryan, you're the best without even trying. Daniel, Daniel Bryan is the best without even trying. Now it's for you, Deluxe Man. From a real Daniel Bryan fan. Eat shit! I don't know what was worse. That song that you just had to listen to, or some of the crap that happened on Raw. Because for some of the fun that I had watching the show, there were some things that just really, really aggravated me. I mean, the crap they're doing with the Divas, until they get to Snoop and Flair having some type of face-off segment, talk about whiskey and weed, I don't care, gin and juice, whatever the hell. Until you give me that, you give me that WrestleMania moment, then we're talking about a Divas Revolution, damn it. But then what I can't understand for the life of me is you finally got a reason to maybe actually care about Alberto Del Rio. You've actually got a reason to maybe get some actual heat on him. He can storyline take credit for the injury to John Cena that's cost him WrestleMania 32. John Cena, not at WrestleMania. Something we didn't know if we would ever freaking see. But it's going to happen. And you've got the perfect opportunity here in ADR to make something out of this and go somewhere with them with this. So they immediately decide to undercut him by having a U.S. title match and have a Callisto win the fucking belt from him. This is why nobody gets over in this stupid fucking company, and this is why nobody can ever break out and become a star. You've given ADR something he can latch on to for months, if not the rest of his goddamn career. And in one night, you managed to completely undercut that, completely erase any chance you had to get any mileage out of that whatsoever. I don't give a fuck if you think the match was good or not. The decision to have this match and make this decision and have Callista go over when the belt was fucking stupid. Why in the bluest of blue fucks would you undercut ADR's character at that time? You're undercutting him. You're undercutting the League of Nations. You're just stupid. It was dumb. You just took months of potential story and eradicated it just like that. Unbelievable. But then when we think of bad, I think about what they were doing with this one versus all match for the main event. And to me, it wasn't so much that it was just bad because it was. It was the fact that it was lazy. It was sloppy. And it was just ridiculous. It seemed unnecessary. It's one versus all, and you've got a whole bunch of other wrestlers out there. But for some reason, Vince and Stephanie just basically send Kevin Owens at Roman Reigns for pretty much the entire time. What is the whole fucking point of having all of these guys out there if it's just going to be primarily a one-on-one -on -one fucking match between Reigns and Owens? And we talk about the stupidity of the WWE storytelling. It can usually perfectly be summed up by what they have the authority do or not do. You've got all these other fucking people there. Fucking send them all in. You're the boss, Vince. Who gives a shit? Who's going to say anything to you? It doesn't matter. And frankly, if we're talking about it, he could still just fire Roman Reigns if he wanted to because Roman Reigns has assaulted him, I believe, on multiple occasions. That is workplace violence and grounds for immediate termination. The whole thought process behind them still going back and forth is stupid. But what's even more ridiculous is you book a one versus all match and it's basically one versus one and the all aren't even serving as fucking lumberjacks. And throughout the whole night, what was really lazy and ridiculous about this was instead of starting off hot and starting off immediately with Brock Lesnar, you do this lame-ass shit throughout the night where Heyman's trying to beg Lesnar out of the fucking rumble saying he should get the title match of Mania. You're taking the big badass and having him act like a cowardly chicken shit heel. Not an entitled title badass, but a chicken shit heel. And he's supposed to be the conqueror of Brock Lesnar. He's supposed to be the hero. Why the fuck are you doing this? This is lazy, stupid, bullshit storytelling. In fact, it tells no story of any consequence or any good significance at all. And of course, it's been telegraphed throughout the whole night. You know Brock Lesnar eventually is going to run out and probably destroy everybody, eventually leading to him destroying Roman Reigns too. And like, oh my God, Brock Lesnar's back. And he's going to win the Rumble and become the new champion. And that's going to be awesome. And we're going to get Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns for the belt at WrestleMania 32. What's well, not awesome. 
They're trying to draw over 100,000 people. You can't come up with a more original fucking title match for your biggest show of the goddamn year. Give me a fucking break. And furthermore, furthermore, you had three hours to incorporate Lesnar in your damn show, and this is how you choose to do it. You choose to wait all the way to the end of the night when the national title game is, of course, really fucking good between Alabama and Clemson. It's just ridiculous. And it was lazy storytelling, lazy writing, and it made no fucking sense. It's a one versus all match, so it was basically Roman Reigns versus Kevin Owens one on one the entire fucking time. What a circle jerk and waste of our fucking time. It was a shame. There were good things on this show. I had fun watching the early parts of this show. But as the night went along, it just went downhill. And I think it really all started with Callista winning the U.S. title and everything else just went downhill from there.